we're now talking about electric fields. So, here, there is an electric field which everywhere has the value E vector equals E0, comma, E0, comma, 0. Now, don't fall into the trap of thinking this is energy. Yes, sometimes we use E for energy, but here E is electric field, so you just have to know from context what it is. And I say E0 is a constant. What is the magnitude of the force on a particle with charge Q? Now, there is one thing I haven't told you here that I should have told you. What is the position of the charge? Because the electric field will be different at different positions, except in this case, the electric field everywhere has the same vector value. So you don't actually need the position in this specific case because it's constant everywhere. So wherever the particle is, that's what the electric field is going to be. So it is, what is the magnitude of the force on a particle with charge 2, Q? Well, the force, of course, is just QE, so that's going to equal QE0, comma, QE0, comma, 0. That's what the force is. I was asking for the magnitude of the force, though. And here's the thing, it is not QE0. That is the trap you might fall into. It's not. In fact, the magnitude of the force is equal to Q squared E0 squared. So what I'm doing is I take the X component and square it, and remember if I have QE0, which is the whole X component, that's the way if you have a squared on a bunch of stuff multiplied together, you can distribute the squared effectively. That's how you do it with products. So that's the X component plus the Y component squared is Q squared E0 squared plus 0 which is the same as the square root of 2 q squared e0 squared. And I can take the q and e0 out of the square root because they're both squared, and I get the magnitude of the force is equal to the square root of 2 times q e0, which to a couple of sig figs, I mean, this is good enough there. Square root of 2 is 1.4. That is the magnitude of the force in this case. Just a very simple example of calculating a force given an electric field. There's your quick first problem. The second problem is very fast. It says, I mean, it's fast to say, sketch the electric field from problem one. Well, okay, so what I'm going to do is sketch the electric field. Here's x, here's y. Z is coming out of the board, and I'm just not going to draw it. What I'm going to draw is what is the electric field in the xy plane, and then I'll talk about how you do it 3D. All right, well, so remember the way you sketch the electric field is you choose a bunch of grid points, a bunch of observation points, you might call it. Where is the place where we're going to observe the electric field? So you have these observation points. So I'm going to just choose several points. You don't have to draw the points out first. The reason I'm drawing the points out first is so you can, to make clear, what I'm doing is I'm choosing these points in space. They're all given by their x, y, z. All the points I've chosen are x, y, z, z, zero. And then at each point, you evaluate what is the electric field at that point. Well, look at this. It's pointing in the plus x and the plus y direction and not pointing at all in z. And it points the same amount in plus x and plus y, so that means it's going to point that way, right, with the x component and the y component being identical to each other. So that's what it looks like there. And then it's the same everywhere in space. So if I was at this point, that's the electric field. If I was at this point, that's the electric field. I'm trying to draw the same vector each time. All right, this is going to take a while, so here we go. All right, so there it is. That's a, a diagram of the electric field everywhere on the xy plane. But really, of course, space is 3D, so what if we wanted to visualize it in all of x, y, and z? Alright, so what we've got here is um, an array of arrows all pointing in the plus x and plus y direction. So here you see this green axis is the y-axis, the red axis is the x-axis, and you see a blue arrow sticking out at you, that's the z-axis. But now what we can do here, this is in 3D, so we can rotate it and look at it from different angles. And you see, yes, this is a field where everywhere there is a 45 degree angle pointing E0 and x and E0 and y everywhere. So, and here you see why we try don't, we don't always do it in 3D because, oh my goodness, it's just, it's a mess, right? And this is why we often have to just look at a two-dimensional slice of the array instead of the whole thing. This does show you the whole thing here, although I would note here, I, I, really it keeps going forever. And I just drew out to a certain distance instead of going forever. So, if, you know, you zoom in, it's more like that. All right, so that's what the vector field would like, look like in a full 3D. 
So I hope that was illuminating. That is the second problem. And the third problem, I'll give you a different electric field, and I tell you to sketch that. So this is E0 times this vector, and remember, this is the same that when you multiply a vector by a scalar, it's the same as saying it's E0x over r, comma E0y over r, comma E0z over r. So those are the same vectors, both case. All right, and so E0's got to have units of newtons per coulomb, because x is meters and r is meters, so that's just a unitless. So unitless times E0 has to be newtons per coulomb. So E0 has to be in newtons per coulomb. So now we need to think about to say, okay, what is the direction? Well, that's a little harder. Um, turns out you already did this in the first problem with just this part. So just to review a little bit, here's X, here's Y. Let's forget about Z for the moment. We'll think about that a little later. If you choose some random position here, I've chosen a random position here, then the direction is going to be X over R, Y over R. Well, notice that if you take the ratio of the y-axis to the x-axis, the length of the y-axis, or the length of the, the y-component, really, the y-component of the electric field divided by the x-component of the electric field is just y over x. Okay? So that says that whatever, and here the x-component is pretty big and the y-component is small, so this to that should be the same as this to that. In fact, it's probably a little too long. So that says that here it will point in that direction. Okay, that's good. Now let's think again though, now that I've drawn this one and it's some distance, so R is the distance from the origin, right? So this is this distance from the origin. And then the question is, how does the magnitude depend on distance? So if I go like half as far out, do I draw a longer arrow, a shorter arrow? Well, let's think about it. What is the magnitude of E as a function of X, Y, and Z? I'm just gonna, do the same thing. I'm going to take the square root of each component squared. So I will have the square root of E0 squared times x squared over r squared plus y squared over r squared plus z squared over r squared. All right. So that's under the, E0 is under the square root. Um, I have a 1 over r squared, which is under the square root, so I can call that r, times the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Hey, but x squared plus y squared plus z squared, that is the distance from the origin. That's what we're calling r. So that's e0 times r over r times r. So the magnitude is the same everywhere, actually. Oh, that's convenient. So having figured out that the magnitude of the electric field is the same everywhere, right? This is the magnitude of the electric field for any x, y, and z is just e0 because all the things canceled out. This won't be true for all electric fields, but this one happens to have a magnitude that's like that. And then if you do the same exercise I did here, what you will figure out is that this vector is actually the r hat vector, which is the unit vector that points away from the origin. That was in the first homework set. So that means everywhere, this, assuming E0 is positive, everywhere this electric field is going to point away from the origin. So I would draw the same size vector there. Right? And then if I drew it here, I draw the vectors like that. If I drew it here, I draw them like that. Drawing the same size and it's always pointing away from the origin. So if I want to draw the whole field, All right, if I wanted to draw the whole field, it would look something like that. I got a little messy there, but the idea is that each one of these, so these are a little not centered quite right, but each one should be pointing away from the origin and they should all have the same magnitude. All right, of course, I've just drawn it in the XY plane, and again, it should have been three-dimensional, so let's look again. What would it look like three-dimensional? All right, so here we have the radial field. So this looks a lot like what I drew on the board. You see there's X, there's arrows pointing away from the center in all directions, although it looks like there's arrows on top of each other, so we'll get to that in a moment. So it's all radial, but again, remember, it's all in 3D. And in fact, you can see sort of a little light blue arrow sticking out at you for the Z. Well, if you actually rotate this a little, you can see, ah, yes, there is arrows pointing away from the origin in all directions. So, you know, the stuff we drew before, like these guys here, which are in the XY plane, yeah, they're just pointing up diagonally and along X, along X. But also here, <clears throat> you see along the Z axis, there's stuff pointing out. And if you look at the back, 
you can see there's a bunch of stuff pointing away, going back, and all that. So it's radial in all directions, and this is what the field would look like if you plotted that field I told you to plot in three dimensions. You notice all the arrows are all the same size, you know, because of perspective, the ones in back look smaller, but that's just the perspective of the 3D video, and sometimes there's foreshortening, but the 3D size of all these is all the same size. So this is your radial field that's got the same magnitude everywhere. Incidentally, this field is undefined at zero, at the origin rather, because at the origin r is zero, so x over r, y over r, and z over r is undefined. So this electric field is not defined at that point, but it's defined everywhere else. And this is what it would look like radially. Whoa, zoom in, zoom out. All right, so third problem. In the fourth problem, I'm giving you this just to And the fourth problem, I'm giving you this problem just to make sure that when I say draw the electric field at a specific point, how you think about it. Because what you saw in the last couple of problems is that I've drawn a whole bunch of arrows to draw the electric field. And students seem to think, oh, so when he says draw an electric field, draw a whole bunch of arrows. That's not necessarily right. The only reason I drew a whole bunch of arrows is to give you the electric field at lots of different positions. In fact, it's everywhere in space. But you can't draw it everywhere because that would be an infinite number of things to draw. So we picked like a grid of what's called observation points and draw the electric field at the observation points. And then we can see what it looks like. So now in this problem, I give you five specific points to draw the electric field at. So we have x and y with z coming out of the board. But it turns out all of them are going to be z equals 0. And then here's one meter, two meter, one meter, two meter. I should try and draw this as square as possible, right? And then the five points I give you are two comma one comma zero meters. So here's the first point. This is A. And then in B, minus two comma one comma zero. So that's B. C, one comma two comma zero. So this is C. D, 1, comma, minus 2, comma, 0, so that's D, and E, minus 1, comma, minus 2, comma, 0, that's E. I haven't drawn the electric field yet, I've just indicated where the points are. All right, now here's what we know from the last problem, is that the, mag the electric field has the same magnitude everywhere, so every arrow I draw is going to have the same length. We also know it points away from the origin, so here it's just going to be like that. So that's the answer to A. Just one arrow. The electric field has a single value at this point. So what's the electric field at this point? Boom, represented by that arrow. And I could say the electric field at that point is this. I lied to you. The electric field at this point is E0 times 2 meters over, and of course, what is R? R is equal to 2 squared plus 1 squared meters, right, plus 0 squared, which is equal to the root 5 meters. So this is 2 meters divided by root 5 meters. I'm sort of plugging in numbers half. And I don't like that, but go oh well. Comma E0 times 1 meter over 0.5 meters, comma 0. That's what the electric field is at this point. There's just one arrow to represent that one vector. Of course, I don't really have to write it out. So it should point away from the origin here, it should point away from the origin there, it should point away from the origin here, and away from the origin there. And just by looking at the arrows, you can figure out what the direction of the electric field has to be, or you just put in the numbers. Hey, when x is negative 1, the x component's going to be negative. So this is the problem where I give you specific points. At each point, there will just be one arrow. Why? Because the vector field has one value at that point. I'm not saying, oh, what's the field everywhere? There's not just a field. There's not a whole bunch of little arrows. That's only if you're trying to do lots of points. At that point, there's one vector value, and there it is. All right, that is the fourth problem. We're rocketing through these, and that's why we've got six. In the fifth problem, a particle is dropped into the top of a box with an electric field as drawn in the picture below. Now, of course, we've only got two dimensions, so what I want you to imagine is that the box extends this way, and I have drawn a bunch of arrows sticking out like this in 3D as well. All right, so it's dropped into the box. It has an electric field like this as drawn, so I tell you that. I didn't actually label it. Oh, I did label it. If you look at the picture, sometimes you'll see an E next to it to indicate all of these vectors represent the electric field as a function of position. 
Well, looking at this, you can see that all of the arrows, I didn't draw it perfectly, but all the arrows are the same length and they're all pointing in the same direction. So this is a uniform electric field. The electric field is the same everywhere. Even like right here, I haven't drawn an arrow there, but when I draw the field like this, I don't mean it exists here and only there, but it's like everywhere. It's a uniform electric field. So in fact, let's just go ahead and define some axes. We'll define x that way, y that way, and z out of the board. And I could say that e is equal to some constant, which I'm going to call e, e0 x hat. Or I could say it's e0, comma 0, comma 0. Right? That's what the electric field is. Where e0 wasn't given, but I'm just writing this down because I need to call it something. It's not just x hat, because that wouldn't have the right units. That's what the electric field is. Now, we drop a particle into this box. The particle's initial velocity is straight down. What do I say? It's dropped into the top of the box, dropped, whatever. So it's dropped into the top of the box. In fact, its initial velocity is zero. Now, there is an implication here. When I say dropped, dropped, what does drop mean? Well, like, like when I dropped that, notice what happened. It went down, wide gravity. So let's assume gravity is acting on this particle. And we know that the force of gravity is always going to be that way. So this particle is going to accelerate down. And in the absence of any forces other than gravity, it would hit the bottom of the box. But in fact, we are told it hits the left side of the box. So what that means is it can't have taken this path. So what path could it have taken? Well, there's a bunch it could have taken. So let me draw three possibilities for the path it could have taken. Could have done that, could have done that, or could have done that, right? So the most obvious would be, well, it hit there, so it just went straight that way. Maybe. Or it could have curved above straight or curved below straight. That sort of covers everything. It's just how much does a curve is the only difference at that point. And are there other kinks and corners? But we'll just consider these three. But let's just think about it. If it followed that path, it would mean that its V0 was, in fact, um, 0. No, it wouldn't. Okay, so let's think about this. Let's think about when, when the particle is somewhere, maybe along one of these paths. So let's say when the particle is here, what are the forces acting on it? So when the particle is there, the forces acting on it are gravity in that direction. And then the electric force, well, all right, if the particle is going to, it starts with no velocity in that direction. If it's going to go over here, it must pick up a velocity in that direction. So the net force must have a negative x component. Right? It starts with no velocity to the left. It obviously at some point had a velocity to the left because it was able to go to the left. So there has to be a negative x acceleration to give it a velocity to the left. And the only other force is the electric force. So we know that the electric force has to point this way. OK. Well, so if the electric force has to point that way and the gravitational force is pointing that way, what does this tell us about the particle? Well, I mean, one thing is the electric force is to the left, right? That's sort of a thing about the particle. But this actually tells us something intrinsic about the particle. Notice if the electric field is to the right, but the force is to the left, by this equation, the electric force is equal to Q times the electric field. To get this vector in the opposite direction of this vector, we need to have Q less than zero. So the thing we can figure out from this is that the particle must have a negative charge for it to go to the left because the force had to be that way. Now, which path does it follow? That's a little bit harder. Um, but here's the thing I'm going to note is that this is constant because the electric field is constant. This is constant. And it started with zero velocity. So the velocity of the particle is just going to be zero, its initial velocity, plus a times t. And a is constant, all right? So the velocity is just going to equal a t or the x is equal to a x t, and v y is equal to a y t. Notice that both of these are just going up linearly with time, and they always have the same ratio to each other. 
right, Vx over Vy is always equal to Ax divided by Ay, which is a constant. So if the Vx to Vy speed is a constant, that means it's always moving at the same angle. So actually, it is the straight line, is the path that it takes this guy. If this had come in with an initial velocity, things would have been different. But we'll worry about that in the future, like say on homework. Fifth problem. In problem six, an electron is released from rest at the front edge, i.e. the plus z side of a region where there is an electric field described by E is equal to 0, 0, 0, 2.5 newtons per coulomb. Right, so there's a region in space like that. Here's the front edge, right? So where do I want to put the x, y, and z coordinates? Let's put, I should use this blue, it's too dim. Here's x, here's y, and then z is sticking out of the board like that. We have a little electron that we stick in here. And it says, suppose this region is a cube 5.0 meters on a side. So that's 0.5 meters. This, surprisingly, is 0.5 meters. I should have drawn a cube. And then this is also 0.5 meters. What is the velocity of the electron when it leaves the region? Well, all right, now inside this cube, there's an electric field that points in the plus z direction. And now I have the problem I'm trying to draw in 3D. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to rotate my axes. Here's x, y, and z. I'm going to rotate it like that. So here's z sticking out of the board. Um, here's x, here's y. I'm going to rotate it like that so y is sticking out of the board. And um, z is down. Right? There's x, there's y sticking out of the board, and there's z. And now I can draw this region of space like this. And now we're going to stick the electron in from the front, which is in the plus z side. So this is the plus z side. So here's where the electron goes in. And then it's going to come out of this region up here. And the electric field inside points in the plus z direction. Now notice, just for maximum confusion, I have made plus z down. So the electric field everywhere inside looks like this, where the magnitude of it is 2.5 newtons per coulomb. So let's think about the electron has a negative charge. So as long as the electron is, I'm going to start it inside here. As long as the electron is inside here, the force, the electric force on the electron is going to be that. Now, let's ignore gravity because it turns out you could include gravity and it wouldn't matter. But let's just leave gravity out of this. Let's assume this is out in deep space and the electric field is the only, or the electric force is the only force acting on this. If you don't like this, if you don't like leaving out gravity, calculate the magnitude of gravity, which is going to be the mass of the electron times g. And then we calculate the electric field, or the, the, the electric force, right, which is going to be the charge on the electron we call E times E. You will discover, if you actually calculate these things, that this is a factor of 10 to the 10 smaller than this. The electric force is 10 billion times stronger. So that's why I'm ignoring gravity, because it's dinky compared to the electric force in this case. OK, because it's an electron. So the force is that way. And in fact, it's constant, because the electric field is constant everywhere in there. It doesn't depend on position. The Q is the charge in the electron times E. E is the same everywhere. And of course, the charge on the electron doesn't change. So the mag so that well, not even the magnitude, that full force is going to be one point, sorry, negative one point six oh two times ten to the minus nineteen coulombs, that's the charge on the electron, times the electric field. Now it's a full vector, zero comma zero comma two point five newtons per coulomb. So if I calculate that force. I'm going to get, it's in the negative z direction, notice, because I'm going to have a negative times a positive. A negative z direction is up, because plus z is down. Um, so let's go ahead and calculate this. 4.005 to too many sig figs, but eh, close, times 10 to the minus 19 newtons. That's the force on it. Well, okay. And actually, it's a vector, so it's in the, um, it's, a, it's minus. 4.05 times 10 to the minus 19 newtons in the z hat direction. So that's the force. From that force, we can figure out the acceleration. So the acceleration is just going to be the electric force 
divided by the mass of the electron. So you have to look up the mass of the electron. I'll just write up here for reference. The mass of the electron is 9.109 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, right? Tiny, tiny. So now we can calculate the acceleration, and that'll be very exciting. Um, let's just notice that the force is zero. Well, here, it's in the z-hat direction. So I'm just going to say az is equal to minus 4.005 times 10 to the minus 19 uh, kilogram meters per second squared. That's what a uh, Newton is. And I divide that by 9.109 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. All right, this is just the z component of the acceleration. And I get, and I get four, uh, minus 4.397 times 10 to the 11th meters per second squared. Oh my word, that's high, right? But whatever, electrons do accelerate a lot, really fast. It's okay, we'll get numbers like this. All right, now that we know the acceleration, what do we do with this? And what's the question? What is the velocity of the electron when it leaves the region? Well, okay. Uh, I'm gonna leave that up there because I might need it. Well, so what does it mean? So when it leaves the region, it's going to be going, here's the electron on its way out, it's going to have some final velocity, and we know that the velocity is going to equal the initial velocity, which is zero, right? it starts at rest, plus the acceleration times the time. But what is the time? How long does it take to cross? We don't know. But we have another kinematics thing we can use, is that r is equal to r0 plus v0t plus one-half a t squared, so R0 here, if this cube is 0.5 meters on a side, this says that it's starting at an R0 of, and so here what I'm going to do is just pull out the Z component. So it's R0Z plus V0ZT, which is 0, plus 1 half AZT squared. It needs to get to Z of 0 the way I've drawn it. It started at Z of 0.5, um, so it needs to get to 0 is equal to, I'm just going to leave it as R0z plus 1 half az t squared. Solve this for t. So if I subtract R0z from both sides, multiply both sides by 2, that'll cancel the 1 half, divide both sides by az, and that's what t squared is. Take a square root of both sides, and I get that. Now you'd be, wait, it looks like I'm taking the square root of a negative number, but you're not. R0z is 0.5, we'll put that in. AZ is negative 4.397, and it's like, oh, okay, we're good now. So let's put those numbers in. It's negative 2 times 0.5 meters, that's the R0z, divided by AZ is minus 4.397 times 10 to the 11th meters per second squared. Stick that in my calculator, and I get. 1.508 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds. That's the time. And now that I know the time, I can figure out the final velocity. Well, we know it's going to be entirely in the negative z direction, right? Because a is entirely in the negative z direction. So vz is equal to azt. There's no acceleration in x or y, so there won't be any velocity in x or y. So that's going to equal minus 4.397 times 10 to the 11th meters per second. That should have been meters per second squared. I had it there. Why am I even? Yeah, I've been, I'm fine. Times, not having left enough space, I'm going to try and draw a real small. 1.508 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds. Leave yourself more space. Multiply those two out, and you get to 3 sig figs. Vz is 663000, or 6.63 times 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times 10 to the fifth meters per second, which sounds fast and is, but it's not relativistic. And really, since I asked for the velocity, I also have to say x is 0, vy is 0. Oh, there's a negative sign there, so there should be a negative sign here. And that is the answer. I've given you the full vector by giving you all three components. I could also have said v vector is minus 6.63 times 10 to the 5 meters per second z hat. And that would have worked as well. So what we did is we sort of started by not 
writing down numbers at first, but let's draw pictures, make sure we know what's going on, make sure we know where the electron is, where it's going. From that, what can we do? Well, there's an electric force, think about the electric field, think about the vector electric field, think about the charge on the electron, figure out forces, figure out accelerations, and then do kinematics we know from last semester. So there you go. That is the last problem, and that's the end of the problems for this week.